Good morning and welcome to Grace Church Online. We are delighted that you have chosen to worship with us this morning. So wherever you are, let's stand up and let's sing together. Who am I that the highest king would welcome me? I was lost, but he brought me in, oh, his love for me, oh, his love for me. Who the sun sets free, oh, is free indeed, I'm a child. He has ransomed me, His grace from the sea. While I was a slave to sin, Jesus died for me. Yes, He died for me, who the Son sets free, oh, is free. This morning, I'd like to turn our attention to the book of John. Uh, this is chapter 6. We're going to start in verse 38. Um, in just uh, another moment, we're actually going to sing a new song that pulls some lyrics out of this passage. Um, and I want us to think about today just how great God's love is for us, what the great lengths he went through to reach us, and what our response should be. So I'm going to go ahead and read starting in 38. For I have come down from heaven, not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. And this is the will of him who sent me, that I should lose nothing of all that he has given me, but raise it up on the last day. For this is the will of my Father, that everyone who looks on the Son and believes in him should have eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day. In this passage, we see that not only has Jesus always been and he always will be, but he came down from his throne to reach us. Um, and inside of that, he did the Father's will. He paid for our sins on the cross. Um, and here we learn that um, if we put our faith in him, if we put our trust in him, not only will we have eternal life, but he's going to raise us up on the last day. So this is how great God's love is for us, that he left his throne in heaven to come to earth, to die on the cross for our sins, that we can have eternal life in him, and that one day we will be resurrected with him in glory forever and ever. So in light of this awesome truth of the gospel, I'd like to invite you to sing about how great our God's love truly is. From the darkness I called your name Into darkness your mercy came You called me out Lifted me up How great is your love You bore my weakness You took my shame Buried my burdens In fields of grace You called me out 
live down to earth in this imperfection give your life for us we are amazed yes we stand in awe for we have been changed by the power of the cross how great how great how great is your love how great how great, how great is your love. How great, how great, how great is your love for us. In your kindness, you lead me home. In your presence, where I belong. Give your life for us, and we are amazed. Yes, we stand in awe, for we have been changed by the power of the cross. How great, how great, how great is your love. How great, how great, how great is your love. How great. How great, how great is your love for us. And there has never been today online. I have two short announcements. The first is that the staff is still meeting on Wednesdays and we long to know the ways that we can be praying for you. We also forward those prayer requests on to our elders so they can be praying for you throughout the week. We have a elder-led prayer night this coming Wednesday on Zoom that will begin at seven o'clock. So if you would like to forward us your prayer requests or sign up to attend the elder-led prayer, you can do so at connect at gracechurchinfo.net. Thank you. Good morning. Would you turn with me in your Bibles to the book of Titus? This morning we continue our base camp series on the foundations of the Christian faith, and we'll be reading Titus chapter 3, verses 1 through 8. 
remind them to be submissive to rulers and authorities, to be obedient, to be ready for every good work, to speak evil of no one, to avoid quarreling, to be gentle, and to show perfect courtesy toward all people. For we ourselves were once foolish, disobedient, led astray, slaves to various passions and pleasures, passing our days in malice and envy, hated by others and hating one another. But when the goodness and the loving kindness of God our Savior appeared, he saved us, not because of works done by us in righteousness, but according to his own mercy, by the washing of regeneration and renewal of the Holy Spirit whom he poured out on us richly through Jesus Christ, our Savior, so that, being justified by his grace, we might become heirs according to the hope of eternal life. The saying is trustworthy, and I want you to insist on these things, so that those who have believed in God may be careful to devote themselves to good works. These things are excellent and profitable for people. Pray with me. God, we thank you for your word, for being a God who loves us and cares for us and gives us words of wisdom that can guide us in our daily life. We pray for open hearts now and minds as we listen to the teaching of your word. Help us to be open to what you have for us to learn. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. In his famous letter to the Romans in the New Testament, the Apostle Paul makes clear his teaching about salvation. He says that on the basis of the death of Christ in the place of sinners, we are saved by grace through faith in Christ alone. And in fact, what he asserts is that in saying that God doesn't save us only while we were sinners. He does say that, but God saves us because we were sinners. And that's why shortly after that, he deals with an objection that I want to think about this morning. It's like an imaginary objector that begins chapter 6 of the book of Romans. And the imaginary objector says, what shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? And his question is essentially this. If God saved us because we are sinners, if our sin caused God to be gracious, then doesn't it logically follow that more sin will cause God to be even more gracious? Now that raises the question. The question is, what exactly is the relationship between salvation and good works? Once we've uh, trusted in Christ, are we free to live however we want? because we're now covered by grace? That's been a question that's been around ever since the gospel was first clearly articulated by people like the Apostle Paul. And as with so many aspects of the Christian faith, it's like we have to listen carefully to what the Bible says. And, and it's like being on a narrow bridge over a precipice. There are dangers on both sides. On one side, in trying to answer this question, there's one problem that we can face and the other is on the other side. One side you might call moralism. Moralism uh, says there's no difference really between salvation and good works. They are essentially the same. Moralism says, yes, we're sinners because we've broken God's moral law. Uh, but God calls us to live for Christ. And so what we need to do is decide to follow the teachings of Christ. Because following Christ means simply doing what he said to do. So when I choose to live by his commands, I am entering into a relationship with God. Salvation and good works are the same thing. I once heard a preacher 
a very famous preacher a long time ago, 25, 30 years ago. I once heard him preach a message in which the point was this, the first step to being a Christian is to act like one. That was the point of his message. The first step to being a Christian is to act like one. In other words, Christianity is simply a set of right behaviors. Choose to act in the right way, and that's what a Christian is. Now, that's moralism on one side. On the other side, there's another danger. Sometimes this is called, a person has been called a libertine, that is, someone who takes liberty a bit too far. And this has the opposite problem. Uh, on this side, it says there's no connection between salvation and discipleship. If God doesn't save us by our good works to begin with, then we're under no obligation to do good works after we're saved. It might be nice, but it's not required. And um, early in my ministry, I probably erred on that side more. I sometimes gave the impression as I look back and as I read uh, sermons and things that I wrote at that time, that I, I sometimes seem to communicate there's no connection between salvation and good works, either before or after conversion. And I'd like to think that through the years, as I've read the Bible more and thought about it and, and, and taught more, I slowly made my way back to a middle position. And what I'd like to do this morning is show you a passage that draws the clear line, the correct line in the correct place between salvation and good works. It's found in the book of Titus in the New Testament, and I will need you to pick up a Bible and look at, look at this passage for a few minutes as we look at it together. We gather that following a a time of ministry on the island of Crete when a number of people had responded to the gospel, Paul later sent, <clears throat> sent a uh, younger co-worker in the gospel named Titus back to the island of Crete to organize the churches that were just at that form in kind of an embryonic form. And in the book, his whole point is to stress the relationship between salvation and good works. In fact, I'd like you to see that if you'll open to the book of Titus. Let me just note a few things quickly. First, uh, the first main paragraph after the greeting has a title that says, Qualifications of Elders. And Paul instructs Titus, the first thing you need to do is establish elders in each of these cities in which there are believers. Elders need to be individuals of good character who can lead the others. And then he notes uh, at, in verse 9, he, an elder, must hold to the trustworthy word as taught so that he may be able to give instruction in sound doctrine and also to rebuke those who contradict it. And then he immediately makes an application of that. If the function of an elder is both to teach positively and to correct false ideas negatively, he makes an application to those who oppose the gospel. And um, he identifies in the next paragraph the false teachers. And at the end of that paragraph, he says these words, they, these false teachers, they profess to know God, but they deny him by their works. They are detestable, disobedient, unfit for any good work. Well, you note in that verse, what the false teachers are unable to do is to connect lifestyle, good works, to their teaching and Paul wants Titus to be able to do that. So then, as you go through the letter, he continually refers to this. Look at chapter 2, verse 7. Show yourself in all respects to be a model of good works. Verses 13 and 14. Waiting for our blessed hope, the, glory, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us to redeem us from all lawlessness and to purify a people for his own possession who are zealous for good works. Chapter 3 and verse 1, remind them to be submissive to rulers and authorities, to be obedient, to be ready for every good work. Verse 8, the saying is trustworthy, and I want you to insist on these things so that those who have believed in God may be careful to devote themselves to good works. And verse 14, and let our people 
learn to devote themselves to good works. I mean, seven times in the letter, in less than two chapters, he refers to good works, the importance of these things. Now, obviously, the letter is seeking to make a connection between salvation, what it means to be a Christian, and good works. But it's really in chapter 3 that he explains most clearly what that proper connection is, and that's what I'd like to look at for a few minutes, beginning in verse 1 of chapter 3. Why is it that Christians must be careful to devote themselves to good works? Well, I'd like to look at this chapter for a few minutes together. If you would look at it with me, I want you to note the first two verses really continue the theme of proper behavior that was begun in chapter 2 where he lists the kind of behavior different age groups and genders in the church should have. But this gives more general to all believers principles about behavior. The first one deals with the Christian in society and essentially by saying be submissive, remind them to be submissive to rulers and authorities, obedient, uh, ready for every good work. He's saying Christians should be good citizens. Remind them to do that. That's their uh, responsibility in society. And then uh, verse 2 deals with the Christian in relationship with others in the community, not broader society as a citizen. And he says in verse 2, to speak evil of no one, to avoid quarreling, to be gentle, and to show perfect courtesy toward all people. In other words, you should be a good neighbor, a, a good person in relationship with others in the neighborhood, in the marketplace. And, and and then, what I want you to know is based on those two principles, the Christian in society and the Christian in community, he starts verse 3 with an important word. It's the word for. For indicates that he's about to give a reason. Here is why I'm giving these behavioral commands. For. Why should a Christian be a good citizen, a good neighbor? He's going to indicate, by what follows, the proper connection between behavior and salvation. First, he says in verse 3 that you should devote yourselves to good works because you remember what you were. You should devote yourself to good works because you remember what you were. Verse 3, for we ourselves were once foolish, disobedient, led astray, slaves to various passions and pleasures, passing our days in malice and envy, hated by others and hating one another. Now, the, re the reason for his um, teaching about proper behavior is, first of all, on like a foundation of we remember what we were. And note that he's speaking to people who were converts out of a non-Christian background. And those who come to faith in Christ without a background of being under any kind of clear teaching about God, about what God expects to us, about sin and grace, often people who come to Christ out of that background can look back and see clearly a distinction between what they once were and what they have become now that they are Christians. Sometimes those who grow up under Christian teaching have more difficulty doing this. They actually run more danger of becoming moralists because they tend to think that the behavior of the Christian life is simply what it means to be a Christian the fact is, according to the Bible, if you don't experience sin, you will never experience grace. Now, I want you to know, particularly if you're a young person here, I am not saying that you have to experience sin in its full-fledged form. I mean, it doesn't require that you engage in wicked behavior um, in order to understand grace. It can be as simple as, well, two words that are used in verse 3, malice and envy. It's not just talking about outward behavior of the body. It's talking about relational sins that every person finds himself or herself struggling with. It can be seen in your inability to control your feelings at times about people, feelings of anger or envy towards people who don't treat you well. Other relational sins like this, which are characteristic of all of us, they're meant to remind us of what we once were. And then, um, having started on that foundation, remember what you once were, he opens verse 4 with another small word, the word but. Yes, it's true, we live this way, but. And that tells you he's about to draw a contrast between what you were and something that has happened to you. 
This tells you there's something else you must do. You must not only remember what you were, you have to remember what God did for you. And what God did is summarized in three words that are really found in verse 5. But God saved us. I mean, obviously, that's the point if you read carefully verses 4 and following. We were once this way, but God saved us. But I want you to note that there's a whole verse of words before you get to that, but he saved us. It says in verse 4, but when the kindness or the goodness and loving kindness of God our Savior appeared... And he's saying that there's something that God didn't do before he gets on to what God did do. In fact, I want you to note, actually, um, in making an English translation, they took the words, he saved us, and they put them where they make the most sense in English, but in fact, they don't occur until after the next clause. So look carefully at verse 4. Here's actually what is written. But when the goodness and loving kindness of God our Savior appeared not because of works done by us in righteousness, but according to his own mercy, he saved us. There's a whole lot of information before he gets to that, he saved us. And he essentially tells you two things God did not do for you before he gets to what God did for you. First, verse 4, he did not save you because of your character, but because of his character. You might say, well, where exactly is that? Well, that's the whole point of the first sentence in verse 4. When the goodness and loving kindness of God our Savior appeared. It's not because of your character. That's not even mentioned here. It's not because of something God looked at and he saw in you and he said, well, I'm going to save you because I see good things there. No, it was purely because of his character, because of his goodness and loving kindness. And then secondly, he did not save you because of your good works, but because of his mercy. That's in verse 5, where he says, not because of works done by us in righteousness, but according to his mercy. That's the central to the gospel, is that basic idea. God does not save people on the basis of their behavior. It's not explicitly stated, not because of works done by us in righteousness. That's the basic reason why we can say confidently, moralism is not Christianity. Telling a person just to start being a good person, start doing what God says, that's all that he wants you to do. That's not the Christian faith, that's not the gospel. You didn't decide one day, you know, I think I'm just going to begin to obey God and then start doing it and doing it well. That's not what happened. God didn't look at your behavior and say, well, I can tell that you're really being serious about this thing. You're, you're really trying hard to do what I said. And so because you're so serious, I'm going to save you. It doesn't say that at all. In fact, it contradicts that idea. It says, when the mercy, or excuse me, the loving kindness of God, our Savior, appeared, not because of works of righteousness, works which we have done in righteousness, but according to his mercy, he saved us, period. He saved us. Speaking of sovereign mercy and grace, freely extended to sinful people, not only while they were sinners, but because they were sinners, completed action. He saved us. Past tense. He's talking to Christians, after all, who have confessed faith in Christ. He saved us. So, you remember what you were before something happened to you. Then you remember what God did not do for you. He didn't respond to your good character, your commitments. He didn't respond to your good behavior. Then he states, finally, what God did for you. He saved you. He saved us, he says, verse 5, by the washing of regeneration and renewal of the Holy Spirit. He saved us by the washing of regeneration and renewal of the Holy Spirit. It doesn't say in the passage, he saved us when we trusted in Christ. That may be true, but that would be to focus on the, the hand that receives the gift, which is faith, rather than the gift itself of eternal life. No, he saved us, and what he did in saving us was he washed us uh, with a regeneration and renewal. The gift is what matters, the gift of eternal life, and it's described here in terms of two actions of the Holy Spirit. 
when he applies redemption to the believing sinner, the washing of regeneration renewal. What are these things? Well, interestingly, the the two words that are used here are not used in the New Testament elsewhere uh, to describe what they are describing right here, but there are other words that clearly describe exactly the same thing. Many places in the New Testament, probably the most famous is John chapter 3. In John chapter 3, Jesus is speaking to a very religious leader of the Jewish nation, a member of the Sanhedrin, uh, which would have been like a senator among the Jewish people, a very religious person, a teacher. And he says to this religious man, you must be born again. And he says, unless one is born of water and the spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. Now, when uh, we hear those words, born of water and the Spirit, our first thought is that it refers to baptism. I can only say um, that would not have been the first thought of a Jewish rabbi in the first uh, century. Um, His first thought would have been of a specific passage in the Old Testament, obscure to us, but well known among these people because it described what they looked forward to. Ezekiel 36 is one of those passages in the Old Testament where the prophets describe what's going to happen when God brings the new covenant. When he brings his people back to himself, he's going to do something specific. And it's described most clearly in Ezekiel 36, verses 25 through 27. The new covenant would involve an effective work of the Spirit inside of people. It would accomplish what the covenant with Moses, the covenant they were under in the Old Testament, was unable to do. It would provide true cleansing from sin and true empowerment to live for God. That's what's described in Ezekiel 36, under the images of water and the Spirit. And those are the things that God does through Jesus Christ when he applies the work of Christ to the believing sinner He brings them into the new covenant. This is what he calls here the water of regeneration and renewal. Regeneration refers to the new birth, making someone a radically new person as though all that the experiences were that they had before, all the sins that they committed, everything that was true of them is taken away and they have a new start. The new birth does not make us new on a horizontal level. Whatever we are by temperament, we still are, though God wants to transform it. Whatever sins we've committed may still have their consequences horizontally, but the new birth makes us new in the eyes of God, makes us a new person with new capabilities. And then, not only is it talking about the new birth, the water of regeneration, but the water of renewal, and that is this imparting of the Spirit's power in order to carry out the work of God in a person's life. This is what's described in the prophets. And from God's perspective, this is what he does when he saves a person. The washing of regeneration and renewal of the Holy Spirit. Now back to Titus chapter 3. Just as when Jesus spoke of water and the Spirit, that's what Paul is describing here is the experience of true conversion. And what is the relationship, we need to ask, between these words, God saved us by the washing of regeneration and renewal, what's the relationship between that and baptism? Well, baptism is the human action in response that points to this experience of the new birth. Let me explain it this way. Every covenant in the Bible, including the covenants with Abraham, the covenant with Moses, they have signs a sign, at least one or more. With, the, with Abraham, the covenant sign was circumcision for himself and all his male descendants, showing their connection to the covenant. Uh, for Moses, the, the sign continued to be circumcision, but there were other signs, the Sabbath, the Passover. These were outward actions that the people participated in to show that they were connected to the benefits of the covenant that they had been given. And we, under the new covenant that has been brought by Christ, are also given signs to, specifically, baptism in the Lord's Supper. A sign, and that's what they're called in the Bible, points by its very nature to a reality. If you see a sign on a road that tells you how to get to a certain location, you follow that sign and you arrive at the location if the sign effectively points you to that location. 
Now the road sign tells you how to get somewhere, but once you find your location, you don't use the sign anymore. The sign isn't the location, and the effectiveness of baptism is not that it gives what it points to. It doesn't give the washing of rebirth and renewal of the Holy Spirit. That would be to confuse the sign with the thing that it points to, the thing that it signifies. But when a covenant sign is a response to the reality, then the two things come together when a person is saying by his response and being baptized, I have experienced what this outward sign points to, that is the washing of regeneration and renewal of the Holy Spirit. It is then a confirmation of the reality of the cleansing of the heart by God. It's done in the sight of others as an entrance into, in a public sense, the new covenant and the new covenant community. In other words, baptism itself isn't the washing of rebirth and renewal. Baptism uh, doesn't impart the washing of rebirth and renewal. Baptism is an outward and visible sign of an inward reality that when it's applied to a person confessing faith in Christ points effectively to the washing of rebirth and renewal which the believing sinner has by faith. That's what he says here. God saved us. He saved us by this cleansing and empowering work inside of us. And why does God do this work? Verses 6 and 7. The Holy Spirit whom he poured out on us richly through Jesus Christ our Savior, so that being justified by his grace, we might become heirs according to the hope of eternal life. He saved us through the Spirit's application of the work of Christ, cleansing and empowerment, so that you might live in joyful anticipation of your ultimate inheritance, your final salvation. And that's why this passage says so clearly, Christianity and moralism are two different things. Moralism is simply a human attempt to reach God. Most of us start that way. Moralism is in reality only possible to people who don't understand the beginning, the foundation of verse 3. You have to remember who you were. There was a difference between that and what you are now. But conversion to Christ is that experience that happens when a person looks to Christ and Christ alone for salvation, doesn't look to his or her character, doesn't look to his or her behavior and good works, to commitment, to Bible reading, to going to church, moral goodness, the right attitude, but looks to Christ alone. Christ, whose death on the cross was in the place of sinful people and all of their sins. It's what happens uh, when God gives you the assurance through faith that on the basis of Christ's death, your sins are forgiven, cleansed, and you are given God's Spirit as a token of the new covenant. In other words, what the passage says is, you must remember what you were. And then it says, you must acknowledge that what you were didn't change because there's something you did. It's not because of your character. It's not because um, of your behavior, because those things would always be inadequate before God. And then you must acknowledge what God did for you. He saved you by the cleansing and empowering work of his spirit to live for him. And it's on that basis that Paul draws the line in the right place. He draws the line. He doesn't say on one hand, well, they're the same thing. Just do the right things. Be a good neighbor. Be a good citizen. That's what a Christian is. He doesn't say that. He doesn't say, on the other hand, there's no connection between salvation and good works because he didn't save us by our good works, and so good works don't have anything to do with it at any time. He doesn't say that either. Verse 8 is where he draws the line. Look at it carefully. The saying is trustworthy. And I want you to insist on these things so that those who have believed in God may be careful to devote themselves to good works. This happens to be one of five trustworthy sayings that are found in the letters of the New Testament called the pastoral epistles, Timothy and Titus. Two letters to Timothy in which four times this phrase is used. This is a trustworthy saying. And this letter to Titus, in which the last one we're looking at now, is found. This is a trustworthy saying. Um, we have to ask, well, what exactly is the trustworthy saying? And well, the answer is it undoubtedly is the full sentence that 
occurs before verse 8. And that full sentence is found in verses 4 through 7. But when the kindness, the loving kindness, the goodness and loving kindness of God our Savior appeared, he saved us not by works which we have done, but according to his mercy, by the washing of regeneration and renewal of the Holy Spirit so that we might live for him. That, that whole saying, he says, this is a faithful saying. And I, I want you to insist on these things. Well, insist on what? Well, probably he could be referring to the whole letter. I want you to insist on all of the behavioral teaching that I'm giving in here and the, the moral teaching and, and all of the reasoning that's given behind it. But most certainly he's referring at least to the, the preceding words where we started beginning in chapter 3 and verse 1. I want you to insist on these things. Well, what are these things? Paul takes basic moral teachings. You need to be a good citizen, a good neighbor. And then he gives the theological reason why these things should be done. The reason these things should be done is not simply because, well, you ought to behave this way. That's what Christians do. They act this way. No, you have to remember that verse 3, 4, because. Here's why we do these things. Because of the way that God saved us. Why should you do good works? If you're a Christian, well, what he says here is you should do good works because God saved you by cleansing you and empowering you to live by his spirit so that you would do good works. Christian salvation is not merely forgiveness, though thank God it is that. But it's not merely forgiveness. It is regeneration and renewal of the Holy Spirit. It reveals itself in a new heart and a new spirit, exactly what Ezekiel spoke of in chapter 36. It reveals itself in a whole new direction of life because of the moral change inside of us. Good works become something that we are impelled to do. I mean, remember that sermon I heard so many years ago? The first step to being a Christian is to act like one. That's a caricature of the Bible's teaching. That's like saying the first step to becoming a car is to put a bike in your garage. <laughs> Putting a bike in the garage doesn't turn it into a car. It only puts it in the place where a car usually is put. And taking a person who is born, as verse 3 describes, in malice and envy and all of the things described there, the things we were if we were Christians, and putting them in a church does not by virtue of being in a church, even by virtue of trying to do the right things, it doesn't change what the person is. This says, he saved us. He must regenerate us and renew us. Christian faith requires that God does something inside of us. He must regenerate and renew us so that we cry out, he saved us by his spirit's work inside of us forgiving us, cleansing us, empowering us to live for Jesus Christ. And that's the relationship between salvation and good works. That's why we are to, in the words of this passage, devote ourselves to good works because of the way God saved us by his Spirit. May God grant that you draw that line that connection between salvation and good works in the right place. Let's pray. Our gracious God, again, we thank you for the gospel message. The gospel is not about us and what we have done for you. The gospel is about what you have done for us. But God saved us by the washing of regeneration and renewal of the Holy Spirit. Grant, Lord, that we might know, despite all of the obstacles that we face, despite the power of remaining sin inside of us, which dogs our heels, we might know what that rebirth and renewal means, that which you've imparted to all who have trusted in Christ alone. And we pray that you would do this for the sake of the gospel, for the sake of your kingdom, and for our sake as a church, we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.
In the darkness we were waiting Without hope and without light To from heaven you came running There was mercy in your eyes To fulfill the law and prophets To a virgin came the word From a throne of endless glory To a cradle in the dirt Church, one of the things that has been so evident uh, among the people of our church during this time is generosity. We have received all kinds of reports of people taking the time to go and get groceries for others or providing for financial needs that others in the church may have or just offering to be an encouragement and a help and a support. And even the, the way that people have given and supported our budget during this time has been incredibly encouraging. And I think it is a tremendous example, not only of the heart that our people have for one another, but also our faith in the Lord and in the fact that he will provide for us all of our needs, which frees us up to be able to give to, to others. We are going to take an opportunity now to have a time of giving. 
there are three ways to give towards uh, the ministry of the church. The first is you can give online through our website. The second is by text. And the third is by sending a gift uh, to our mailing address at the church. And uh, we, again, thank you so much for your generosity and, and support during this time. Let's go ahead and pray for our offering. Father, we want to just stop and thank you. We recognize that you are the giver of all good gifts and that every need of ours that has been supplied is met by your grace and, and goodness in our lives. And so we want to thank you for that. We pray for uh, the needs of each person who is in our church. We ask that you would protect people's jobs and that that you would uh, enable each to provide for their families and we thank you for your provision of our church family and pray that uh, together we could be a part of meeting the needs of those within our church family and within our community as as needs arise and, and even all around the world father as we uh, move to a time of giving now we are just grateful and joyful for your gifts uh, specifically the gift of christ which is the greatest possible gift that you could have given us and we pray that as uh, we are able to give back to you that you would uh, encourage our hearts as we do so that that you would uh, remind us of your uh, ownership of everything that we have and we pray that we would be a, a blessing even as you have blessed us so we pray that uh, these gifts would be utilized for your purposes and that you would be the strength behind every work that we do as a church and we ask all of these things in jesus name amen as we close our service for today let me uh, note that it's my hope that as you watch these things you are able to enter in some small way into the worship that we do when we meet all together i know we're all feeling a real sense of desire to be together again we're trusting that God will allow us as a state and as a nation to open up in such a way as to uh, alleviate the spread of the coronavirus, but also to enable us to continue to uh, grow our country, to care for our families and our communities. So may God give you, by his grace, this week, the peace that is found in Christ. And may you, by his spirit, know what it means to love him and to serve him. Go in grace.